Hi, we're talking to Jeff Watson, who is in his final year of PhD at USC and is doing some really interesting work with what are called alternate reality games, but in general, uh, blending play and participation in everyday life and learning and, and civic engagement. I'm, I'm really interested in the way you, you kind of enable people through play to, to force uh, collaboration. Can you tell, tell us about what you're doing? Well, <clears throat> yeah, the, the great thing about play, the great thing about when, when people are truly playing is that they'll pour endless amounts of energy into a game. Uh, if, the, if they really are investing themselves into it, I mean, we've all sort of seen the example of, of kids playing Pokemon or, you know, in a previous generation, something like Dungeons and Dragons, where, uh, you know, because the, the, the game was, was meaningful in some way to them personally and had a social utility uh, and enabled them to perform their identity in some way, um, and, uh, you know, was something that pulled them in and that they weren't, you know, in a way forced to do. It's, it's something that they, they were voluntarily stepping into. Um, you know, players will, will learn enormous amounts. Think about, you know, how much kids uh, who are really into Pokemon know about the whole arcane universe of Pokemon or, or the, you know, the Dungeons and Dragons universe of, of a previous generation. Um, so finding ways to to leverage that enormous amount of uh, you know creative and and uh, social energy that people and participatory energy that people are 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 capable of pouring into games and and finding ways to leverage that towards uh, civic engagement or educational ends um, seems like a, a, an area worth investigating to me um, and so that's been that's been one of the main focuses of my work over the past four years at USC. Tell, tell me about the, the reality game, the, the, the one that you did for um, incoming students at USC. So reality is a, uh, a, a secret underground game that the students played last semester, uh, this fall of 2011 at USC. It was, it was for incoming undergraduates in the cinema school. And it was meant to jumpstart collaboration, get them right into media making and meeting one another and connecting with the community of the cinema school. The, over the past you know, few decades, the cinema school had actually become very siloed and fragmented based on discipline. And we wanted to try and get the students mixing a lot faster uh, earlier on in their careers so that this would create kind of creative serendipity that media arts education really depends upon. Um, so the game was actually completely optional for students. There was no, uh, we, we also kept it a secret from students. We tried to make it something that they would discover on their own and in so doing invest that creative and, and uh, agency uh, oriented kind of energy where it was, it was something that they were doing of their own accord mm -hmm. and the theory was that this would enable them to pour a, a, a different kind of energy than, than they pour into uh, sort of mandatory studies. Um, and so it, it, was a, it was an experiment in, uh, in, in a very kind of unofficial, peer-centered learning system. How, how does that work? How do you achieve <clears throat> a, a critical mass of players by enabling them to discover it rather than you know, kind of telling them what to do? Well, this was the big risk of the game. We wanted to we wanted to apply some of the stuff that I'd learned over the of, over the years, uh, looking at alternate reality games that are sort of deployed in the wild or outside of educational institutions. And one of the the big keys to making those games work is creating a pull experience rather than a push experience for the player. So, in in the sort of parlance of of marketing, a, a push experience is something where you're really like, "Hey, go go buy this. There's a sale. Um, you know, check it out. Head head down to the to the supermarket." Um, and pull marketing is is more like maybe viral marketing, uh, where you're 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 setting out some kind of little mystery or or a tantalizing clue that's drawing the uh, the consumer or in this case the player into the experience. And in alternate reality games, what this sort of mystery tone achieves is, is it, it really activates the, uh, the player's imagination and gets them feeling like, um, oh, this is something that I'm discovering. This is something that belongs to me in a way. Um, and, and that sort of activates a different kind of agency that we wanted to explore. How, how, how will that agency affect 
uh, the, the kinds of energies that the, the, the players put into this. Um, so we, we created a, basically a little mystery for the, for the students to discover. We, we didn't tell them about the game. We uh, got the faculty to buy into not even acknowledging that the game was going on and to disavow it if asked. Um, and uh, this made the students very curious because when they started seeing things like the game's logo, um, you know, hanging in a flag uh, from a flag in the courtyard in the center of the school, um, and 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 then further investigating that, finding little clues around that flag that ultimately led to the game office where they would get inducted into the sort of secret card game that was at the core of this experience. Uh, and the players didn't know it was it was of uncertain status. Uh, is this an official program? Is this something underground? Is this something students are running? I think as as the experience went on, the students were able to obviously intuit that this is this is part of the school. Um, but you know, you you tend to investigate things that are unknown or or are uh, in some way unexpected, and so we wanted to 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 really leverage that unexpectedness to get the students to follow their own curiosity into the experience. And then once there, we needed to deliver an actual experience because it's, in a way, the easy part is is drawing people in through mystery. But if there's nothing there when you get in there, it's just a shaggy dog. And 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 so we were very careful to, in a way, all that sort of mystery stuff was just the gateway or the rabbit hole that led the students into the actual game, which was a, a tight card-based game mechanic. Can you paint a picture for me of how that works so i'm a i'm an entering usc student in this program what where do these cards come from and, and what do i do with them and how do i interact with others how do i discover this game right so uh, some of the students we there are there about 150 incoming freshmen some of them received these mysterious postcards only we only sent out about 30 of those we wanted to make we wanted to constantly be playing with scarcity so for, imagine you're one of the students that receives one of these postcards. All the postcard says on it is carry your cards with you at all times. And there's no further information on it. There's no USC branding. You've just got this postcard. And you got this, th these students got this in about July, and, and school began uh, mid-August. So maybe you get that, you think about it, you forget about it. Uh, then you show up on campus, and uh, right the the day before you show up, you get a mysterious email that just has a uh, a string of numbers in it, um, and, uh, and and but some reference to your actual uh, location where you, where you live uh, in the dorm at USC. So clearly, and it's from a mysterious person named uh, Doctor Hoisinga. Um, so so students would get this, and if they decoded the message in there, it would uh, lead to this web page, which was just an image, which, said, which was a set of instructions about what to do when you see the flag. And again, there was no explanation. What flag? What, what is this about? But it had the game logo on it, and it's, it said, when you see the flag, uh, go to the flag, go in a group, uh, look around, there will be further instructions there. So then during that first week of class, we hung this actual flag, which uh, we, we have several of these. Um, so we hung, these, we hung one of these flags up from the um, uh, third floor balcony in the courtyard at the school, and we left a, a small Super 8 camera with a little, uh, a little star on the side of it. And if you opened the camera, so if you went to the flag and you found this camera, which also had the game logo on the camera, inside there was a little, uh, a little sort of clue, puzzle clue. And if you, dec if you decoded that, it would tell you where the location of the secret game office was. And the, the clue would say, come and play, and it was the, then the room number of the game office. The game office was a physical office where myself and, and some other game runners would, would reside for uh, pretty much every day that the game was on. The game ran for 120 days. And so we, in a way, it was kind of like office hours for us, but we would just sort of staff this game office. Um, and so as a player, then, if you found this clue, you would then follow it, and uh, come into the game office where I would give you a packet of cards and a login for, for the website, for the game. Um, 
I would also say that I don't really know what this is. I'm just a grad student who's been hired to uh, to manage this office. But there's instructions on the website and there's instructions in the game card packet. So then the players would look through the game cards. There was a little instruction card in there that told them how to play the game. And the game is basically about combining cards. And by combining the cards, you create creative prompts. And then you score points in the game by actually making media based on those creative prompts and submitting them to the website. Um, so the students would gradually figure and piece out how that component of the game, which is really the main play of the game, works uh, for after that encounter in the game office. All of this would lead to word of mouth spreading knowledge of the game. So for the first few players, they went through that whole cycle of finding the flag and finding the little clue box and then ending up at the game office. But then gradually they started posting to Facebook and saying what they had found. The other students started hearing about this. And then as the game went on, each week, the points leaders at the end of each week would be connected to these mentorship experiences with alumni from the school, where they would go on these very kind of intimate encounters with alumni at, at odd locations, very different from your typical encounters that you might have with, with an alum or a mentor. Um, and, uh, and, and word of that started to spread around too, and that increased the buzz and started to draw more players into, I want to find out about this. You know, that, that, that sounds interesting, that sounds like something fun. And then also the fact that all the students were submitting all this, these media projects that they were creating through the game, those were then being shared on Facebook as well. And the other students were like, hey, I want to create media projects too. I'm, that's why I came to media arts school. Um, so it started to kind of feed back on itself, kind of like a dynamo, and, and, and drew in, gradually drew in. That first week was totally nerve-wracking for us because we didn't know if this strategy was going to work. Um, but after, after that feedback cycle started going, uh, quickly we had a kind of a hockey stick graph, and uh, students were signing up, and, and we, got, we got about 70 to 80% of the incoming class by the end of the semester was participating in the game. Well... That sounds like fantastic for the students that were involved in it, probably something that they will remember for a long time. Of course, uh, I think the element of surprise and mystery is part of it. It doesn't sound like something that you, that you would foresee replicating on thousands of campuses because you're probably not going to have the, the sense of mystery. What, what would you extrapolate from this about how others might think in terms of including play and this kind of forced collaboration um, and mystery in, in learning. Yeah. Well, I mean, first on the mystery count, it's, that's definitely going to be an issue for us because we're going to run the game again next year. Um, and absolutely, the students who come into this school have done their research. They will know that this game happened last year. Um, because it ended up getting some press. And, and if you do Google searches for USC Cinema School, now you start getting a lot of stuff from the game um, as, as in your search results. So the students are going to know, so we won't be able to leverage mystery the same way. But I think we can still go with some of those basic practices of making it feel alternative and outside of the regular stream of school. If, if, uh, if we were to make the game mandatory, for example, that would really kind of undercut, we believe that would undercut a lot of, the, a lot of that sort of voluntary agency that we're, we're leveraging out of the players. Because that's, that's sort of the, one of the big meta learnings that we've, we've had out of this experience, is that you can use games in education in a lot of different ways. Obviously, games are really good at teaching systems thinking. They're really good at um, showing, uh, instruct, taking students through different kinds of uh, models, through uh, experiencing with consequence and experimentation. And they're also capable of making these rhetorical arguments that other forms of media aren't capable of making. But what we're trying to leverage in in uh, in our game is is not just that, but you know, we, we feel that when, when a player is not, uh, when a player has been forced to play a game, um, maybe they're not truly playing in, in the fullest sense. Maybe it's something of a simulacrum of play. And we wanted to see, well, what kind of output will we get from students if they're truly playing? And so at every step along the way, our objective was, we want to make this something that is truly like any other game, it's something that is they're going to play because they're interested in, because it's fun, 
because it has a, a pull a, a, and a draw to it and it, because it's a, a place for them to channel their agency and identity. And, and so, and every, every design decision we went along, we made along the way was really based on that and not on maybe more traditional educational game design uh, uh, frameworks like assessment or uh, scalability. <laughs> and we think if there's anything then that scales out of this project, certainly you can scale out uh, the card interaction. The card interaction is basically a creative brainstorming tool which uh, you know you could you could port to a lot of different educational contexts and you could make into a, a mandatory game assignment or, or whatever. But the sort of larger learning that we're, we're and the larger body of knowledge we're trying to generate through this project is is what can we do when when we're really leveraging uh, when we're really trying to make a real game and, and engage students in real play, which is sort of inherently um, uh, a choice rather than something they're being forced uh, to do. Sounds wonderful. I don't know if that answered your uh, question. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, like a rambling answer to me. Well, it's, it's, a, it's really exciting research. I'm, I'm wondering whether we're going to see the day in which it becomes development, in which there are ways in which people who are not as versed in the game design as you are could do things like enable, you could substitute the word um, uh, learning in there. To, uh, you, you can't, pe people go to school and because they want to learn, but they're really forced to participate in the education process. You have to go to class, you have to do the tests. How could, how could this kind of voluntary e excitement and participation spill over into, into the kind of learning that people do on, on college yeah. campuses? That's the, an exciting question. I, I think it's really exciting and it's, you know, some of it uh, goes off of, you know, research around communities of practice where you see um, that the learning uh, in, in, in many communities of practices takes place uh, maybe more through the apprentice to apprentice relationship than the master to apprentice relationship and that really the masters can also be learning from the apprentices and and vice versa um, and 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 I think a game like this enables is is a way to kind of grease the wheels of that apprentice to apprentice learning or peer to peer learning um, and and in that sense it's 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 not really something that's competing with we never thought of this as like, okay, we're going to replace the whole, you know, mandatory education system with a with a big game that's entirely optional. Uh, but we do feel like it's 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 an important augmentation to uh, to any existing system, and and we we feel like it can scale beyond this. We just wanted to really develop uh, our initial model uh, in in a very sort of constrained way without. Um, sort of, you know, planning too far ahead. Sometimes it's, it's a bit of putting the cart before the horse at, from a designer's perspective to be designing for, okay, how is this going to scale to like 5,000 schools next year? Um, it, it can sort of inhibit your ability to experiment. And so we really tried to constrain our experiment just to this small population. And now hopefully we, we're going to be able to start deriving best practices that we can expand out to, to, to broader context. Um, and that's, that's definitely the future of this research. I, I look forward to hearing about what, what happens when you try, try this again in the fall. Yeah, it's, it's going to be an interesting puzzle for us to solve, to, to, to make that work. Well, this has been Mind Expanding. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much, Howard. Great talking to you.